Welcome to week three of the history of photography. I'm Charles Edwards, and this week we're going to talk about 19th century portraiture. Before photography, portraiture was a specialty item requiring an artist and his canvas and paints, and was really done by the very wealthy. It was kind of the mark of wealth. People had when a person passed away, you had no record of how a person looked. It was just for your memory, and memories fade with time. The earliest attempts at portraiture were silhouettes. These are silhouettes of my daughters. These were done at Disneyland 20 years ago. But in principle, they're the same thing. It's a piece of black paper that is neatly trimmed out to hold the profile of a person. This little girl is like your age now. Um, portraiture, as I said, was the mark of the wealthy, but along came photography and you could take pictures of people, but the challenge was really long exposures. The inability, the requirement that your eyes stay open for three to eight minutes without blinking. Um, early portrait studios were on the top floor of a building with these vast skylights. Let me grab something I need. Hold on, my apologies. Sorry for the interruption. You had to hold your eyes open for like several minutes in a sunny and bright area because the film was so slow, it required a long exposure with a lot of light. One of the things they did in the earliest studios, and this is what I just grabbed, was they would line the windows with blue bottles or blue glass. And the key to that is, as I mentioned in daguerreotypes and calotypes, they were sensitive to ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light is very similar to blue. This will, ultraviolet light can go through blue glass. But once you line to the windows with blue glass, you knocked out the red and the green, you darkened the room considerably, and it was easier on the eyes to do a long exposure. So they would use blue bottles or blue glass for the windows. They also had to have these little um, brackets that would hold the head in place to help you sit exactly still so you didn't waver around. And they would also have uh, the subject place their hands on their knees or on their hip or hold something to keep them from moving because hands very often are shaking and moving around. And the key was to avoid having a blur. I'm gonna show you some photographs from, now these are tintypes, we discussed tintypes last week, of a couple. And this, as I already mentioned, is a union case. It's made from lacquer and sawdust and pressed into a mold, probably the earliest forms of plastic. This is a daguerreotype, if I can get this on the black card here, so you don't look in the mirror, of three children. Photographs of children are rather challenging because kids don't sit still well. So you see a lot more photographs of adults than you do of children. Now, this is uh, interesting in that it's a really small child and then a couple of tin types of the, I presume the parents, we don't know, I don't know who these people are anymore. They're long since lost. Also the child's uh, outfit has been hand colored blue. In those days, for an extra fee, they would take notes of the colors of your clothes and hand color it. When we get to color photography, I'm going to do a little demonstration of hand coloring. So it would match the color of your clothes. Uh, early film did not recur, recur, record the color red well or the color green. It would be more sensitive to blue. So you'll see women in these black dresses and black clothes. It could very well have been bright red or green, but they recorded as black on early the more primitive films of the day. This is another daguerreotype, a mother with daughter, I presume a father with son. Sorry about the reflections. Does that help? And remember, this is the actual film Daguerreotypes cannot be reproduced. So this is the actual stuff that was handed, that was photographed in the camera and handed right to the people who were purchasing the photograph. 
Now this next photograph, I want to talk about the 19th century. In the 19th century, people had six, eight, 10, 12 children, realizing that in all likelihood, not all of them will survive to adulthood. So very often when, it's, when it, someone died, a child, it was not unusual, they would take the child right to a photo studio and take a picture because that kid was in the ground in the day. So this is a photograph of a child who is in all likelihood deceased. Now, all of these people from the 19th century are deceased. None of these people are alive anymore. No one lives that long. They'd be like 150 years old if they were. But these photographs of deceased children often held a Bible or a cross, or in this case, it looks like a paper doll. And tragic though it is, this was like the last photograph you ever have of this child. Very often, these children were standing with their brothers and sisters and then they would prop their eyes open they kind of help hold them up and get the last photograph a challenge what can i say i want to now show you a powerpoint i'm going to put some things away here i want to go over some names here and the names are from your uh, list of notes albert Sands Southworth and Josiah Johnson Hawes. It doesn't say Johnson. They were a portrait team from Boston. They were almost primarily in daguerreotypes. They were very successful. They photographed the famous people of the day, John, late uh, former president John Quincy Adams, and uh, President Fillmore as well. They photographed really famous people and they had quite a successful business out of Boston. David Octavius Hill and Robert Adamson were Scottish photographers. This was a team where Octavius Hill was in charge of the light and talking to the subjects and Robert Adamson was the techno whiz who would adjust the film, prep the film, develop the film and expose the film. Um, they were successful. That's not an unusual combination. Somebody who's the techno whiz and someone else who has the artistry. That is not unusual. Robert Addison did not, he did not live long. We don't know much about him. His life is kind of, the subject of his life is pretty much lost to us. After the death of Addison, Hill didn't work much longer. He kind of, he lost his oomph. He, you know, running the camera and the film as well as setting the whole scene was over his head. Nadar was the famous, famous celebrity photographer of Paris. He set up his fa a fabulous studio for himself. All these studios were the top floor, all glass ceilings, skylights in all directions. We'll see some examples shortly in the PowerPoint. And he photographed celebrities. We'll see some of his stuff. Etienne Carijan, um, another French photographer, started out as a caricaturist. He would, you know, draw people and make little caricatures of the famous of the day. And later moved into photography, but we'll see some of his caricatures as well. He worked primarily in Woodbury types. When you see his photographs, you'll see really fine detail in the print. And that way only a, not only, but in those days, a Woodbury type would have delivered. Hugh, Dr. Hugh Welsh Diamond uh, lived in England and he ran a psychiatric ward for primarily for women a sanitarium. And at that time, there was a belief that the, that the shape of a person's head revealed information about their personality type, whether or not they had criminal element or were prone to violence or an instability. So he did lots of photographs of his patients thinking that something in there was going to reveal the nature of their ailment. Um, we no longer believe this to be true. It was called physiognomy, I believe. And no one believes this stuff anymore. You know, like your face says much of anything like that. John 
Thomas John Bernardo, Irish, was a wealthy man and a philanthropist. And he would, he built a home for what he called uh, wayward lads or basically homeless children who had no future. And he used his photography to promote this, his philanthropic work. He basically, uh, roughly, of course, the career of the expansive time of his home for children, 60,000 children would go through those homes. Of those, he was sued 88 times. He survived every lawsuit because he was such an eloquent speaker in court. But he was sued and charged with taking, basically taking kids off the street to fill his home for uh, destitute children. Matthew Brady was the big deal American portrait photographer, a bigger deal than Southworth and Hawes. His studio was set up in New York City. He has claimed to fame as the photography of Abraham Lincoln and other, and other noteworthies. Um, he also later set up a studio in Washington, D.C. because there was so many uh, political figures to be photographed there. And he had one of his assistants run that. It was Timothy O'Sullivan or Alexander Gardner ran the studio in Washington, D.C. A cartoonist, which uh, Andre Desiree had in 1854 is a series of photographs in a camera with a series of lenses. You take the pictures and you, the film moves in the background and you can take more pictures. And these can be cut up rather easily into smaller photographs. This was made first made popular when, the, when they photographed Napoleon III. And the cardivist of him translated immediately into fame and popularity for this business. So I want to put that away. And I want to go to this, and I'm going to share a screen. Here we are, 19th century portraiture. So this is what a studio would have looked like in the 19th century. Um, it's a huge amount of glass. The window's probably facing north. That table that the camera's on is, would be a tripod. It was, it was full of furniture, so you could reset the furniture. With canvas backdrops, there were often um, English garden scenes. Here's another example. Up here, you see uh, an arrow. It was, you see the word north. That would be French for north. So a north-facing light is a very flattering light. It's not as harsh. You don't have the sun crashing right through. Now, if you look closely, you'll see a man up on a, at the top of the stairs. And behind his head, you see a brace that holds his head in place. And these would be very, the various the team working in a portrait studio to prep the, to prep the film. Remember, this is probably daguerreotypes. And it was prepped rat or wet plate and prepped rather on the spot. Now this is the studio of Camille Sylvie. As you can see, the ceiling is all glass. We're going to look at his work in a few minutes. Camille Sylvie was a French photographer. We're also going to visit him when we get to travel photography because of his documentation of French Algeria. But he, he did a ton of portraiture in France. Another portrait studio, again, that would be a tripod with the camera on it. Nadar. Also photographed a Paris from a balloon. And that's one of the very first things he ever did that made him famous. Nadar himself. Um, celebrities. George Sands. What is the key of portraiture? It is to reveal the personality, not just, you know, is the picture on your driver's license a portrait or just a, a headshot? Is the photograph on your SAC ID a portrait really? 
Does it tell who you are besides it reveals your name? So this uh, a sitting, you know, the key is to get someone to be themselves and to show something of their personality. This is Sir John Herschel. This is um, Victor Hugo, a deceased gentleman. Etienne Carjot was a French portraitist. He was also a, he would do caricatures. And that's what got, and that's what, how he was able to ingratiate himself to the, the famous of, you know, the inner circles of Paris. I think that's Freud. So those are examples of his caricatures and that's Carjot himself. This is Charles Baudelaire. Um, he was a uh, French poet. And look at the pose of this guy and look at, look at the way he lifts his head. You know, there's a pride in there. This is uh, Italian composer. An Italian composer, his name eludes me, a mime. French actress. Southworth and Hawes were from Boston and they worked in daguerreotypes. So these would be socialites of the day in Boston. This would be a cardivist with multiple pictures of the same person in one frame. That is Southworth as a self, a self portrait of Southworth child. And you know, look how hyper sharp these are. These are daguerreotypes. See how incredibly sharp and detailed they are. Uh, this is Haas and that's Southworth. They Southworth took this picture of Haas. Haas took this picture of Southworth. And how much is being said in this portrait of this person, almost in a spiritual sense? Octavia Hill and Adamson were from Scotland. They worked primarily in calotypes. They believed the calotype, the softness of the calotype, was more honest, more true. They felt that the incredibly sharp daguerreotype was unfair, and many people felt it was unflattering. Especially women didn't like the daguerreotype because they showed every single detail. And look at the hand on that guy's shoulder. I mean, there's a lot in this portrait of personality and relationships. They would also photograph average people in Scotland, fishermen very often. This is a guy repairing a fisherman's net. But as you can see, these pictures are quite soft. And flat in contrast. These are fishermen's wives waiting for their husbands to return. Men in armor, I think they were more or less as costuming it at that point. Child's asleep. More wives waiting for their husbands to return from sea. Camille Sylvie, French portrait photographer and travel photographer. Sylvie learned photography and turned, turned around and made a successful career out of it, photographing all sorts of people throughout all walks of life of Paris, walks of life. That's Sylvie himself sitting with two women. Look at the man's, look at the man's posture. A man of means and a man of success people on the street. 
That's Camille Sylvie. And notice the hands are always doing something, not just moving, but holding and staying in one spot. Your challenge was to get the hands to stay still so that they wouldn't be moving, they wouldn't be in motion during a long exposure. <clears throat> Sylvie. Now, Sylvie, I want to say one more thing about Sylvie. Sylvie was only a photographer for a few years. He believed that the some of the chemicals were attacking his nervous system. And so he left photography and went intermittently in and out of hospitals and sanatorium. And now we believe he probably had extreme depression. Matthew Brady, American photographer, ran his studio out of New York. This is a, Matthew Brady did an ingenious thing. He would photograph important people and create um, prints that could be reproduced and give them to all the newspapers in New York City. Right now, you think of the New York Times like that's it. And what, you know, in these days, there could be easily a dozen competing newspapers in New York City. So he would give one to every paper. And so the demand for his imagery, you know, he created his, he created his fame. That's also Matthew Brady. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was the first president to be photographed before he was in office. Another Lincoln. Another Matthew Brady. I think this is from the same sitting as this. And look at the soft roll around light. You know, the highlight across her nose, a soft shadow on the other side of her nose. Nicely done. A very large source of light in that studio. He also photographed many noteworthies. Here we have a Union General. That's William Tecumseh Sherman General. In the South, he's considered a war criminal. That's General George Custer. That's Robert, General Robert E. Lee. That's uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Tom, John, Thomas John Bernardo it was from Ireland and he would photograph home for working and destitute lads. He used his photography to promote his philanthropic work and photograph children. A lot of before and after pictures of how hard it is for children. And this, you know, this one actually should be before this one. Here's a good example on the left a child apparently in rags, and on the right, the child's in school and learning. I'm not sure what the numbers mean. Maybe they were had been arrested. I have no idea, but a lot of kids have a plate with numbers hanging around their neck. Now, Bernardo, as I said earlier, was uh, was uh, sued or taken to court 88 times that he was taking kids off the street to fill his. Uh, Institute. He was an eloquent speaker and got himself out of it all 88 times. But look at the condition of these children. You know, now they're in school, they have food, they have clean clothes, they're learning. You know, their lives are improved. When we get to Jacob Reese in 20th century documentary, he is the photographer who photographed children in working in factories and brought about the child labor laws that you enjoy today. Look at all these kids. These are kids from his institute. And that's Bernardo. A great portrait. You know, look at the way he carries himself. And think about the way you carry yourself. Think about your body language. Hugh Welsh Diamond. Uh, ran an institute for women, a sanitarium, and he would photograph his patients. 
in the belief that the photography would reveal something. I believe that's him. I mean, look closely, her eyes aren't even looking in the same direction. This is harsh. His intent was to help these people and get to the root of the cause of their um, in, insanity is an unfair word, but their challenge. And I think that's him, Hugh Henry Welsh himself. Now, this is 19th century portraiture. And, and in our next section, we will look at 20th century portraiture. And that's when you'll be assigned paper two. I'm going to stop sharing screen here as well. And that's when you'll be assigned a paper two to compare and contrast 19th century portraiture, how it was done, how revealing it was, how accurate it was, the nature of the image. Um, I don't want you to knock yourselves out, but I want you to see the difference between the two centuries in portraiture and to explain it to me. And you'll submit these online through Canvas. And uh, thank you for your time.